In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, I count it a real joy and a personal blessing to be invited into your home on these occasions to search the Word of God for a meaningful relationship with God here in this world and to enhance our mutual hope of life with Him in the world to come. Thanks so much for inviting us in. Memorial Day was originally defined by date as May 30th, but it isn't that way anymore. It's the last Monday in May. That means another three-day weekend, which is important to our modern society and probably adds more to the pleasure of the day than to the memory of the noble dead or the events or causes in which, uh, uh, in which and for which uh, they acquired the status of nobility. Memorials are important. And they're important to people as individuals and to civilizations, and it's important to keep them alive. How soon we forget. For example, on this day, the Hall of Fame was dedicated in 1901. Hmm. Which Hall of Fame? The Cowboy Hall of Fame? Baseball's Hall of Fame? Softball's? Football's? Which Hall of Fame? The Hall of Fame dedicated in the Bronx, New York, in 1901, is not as remembered now as even some of the others that are much newer. And that's the point. Memorials are not self-sustaining. The ones that live on are kept alive by people who care about those people or events or causes which they commemorate. So it's true. Memorials are important. That's the subject of our program today, and following the hymn directed by Ken Helterbrand, I'll be back for Bible reading and prayer. before our Savior's crucifixion, he assembled with his disciples to observe the Passover supper, which was an annual feast of the Jews in remembrance of uh, the Passover in Egypt. And uh, as he was eating, Luke says in chapter uh, 22 and in verse 15, he said unto them, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. 
Now let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful to you for this account of the institution of the, that, of the memorial for Jesus, the one that he made for himself. And as we think about it today, we pray that we'll be drawn closer to him and closer to thee. Bless our study today with your presence. Open our hearts to an understanding of your will. In his name we pray. Amen. It's been said, he who controls the past controls the future. People who regard their history as glorious and like the way the things are going and want to maintain that course respect and make a positive effort to keep their memorials alive. While a society built on cha bent on change uh, will hurry that change along by perverting or disregarding or even destroying memorials to historical persons or events. It was interesting to me it's, uh, when we visited uh, East Germany immediately after the fall of communism and even the Berlin Wall, even before the reunification of Germany, that the people had already so quickly overturned or broken down the monuments and memorials to Lenin and Stalin and other great communist leaders and events. In some instances, the pieces of those monuments still lay scattered in ruins on the lawns of public buildings as we passed along the streets or the sidewalks. To change the national direction, it is not only important to rewrite the history books, it's also necessary to destroy the nation's memorials because they tell the story of a nation's glorious past too. Memorials can be uh, destroyed either by breaking them down, as I mentioned the people had done in East Germany, or just by neglecting them. Memorials are of two kinds. There are monuments and statues such as the Washington and Lincoln and Jefferson, Memorial, Jefferson memorials in our nation's capital. And there are movable ones, such as Washington's birthday, which we no longer observe. We've combined it with Lincoln's and call it President's Day. Then there's Independence Day on July 4th, and Memorial Day and Veterans Day. All memorials are significant to the people who erect them, and to them it'd be unthinkable 
that there would ever be a generation who would not value them as they did or as they do the current situation, of course. One of our newest memorials is Martin Luther King Day. Another, and probably the most visited memorial in Washington, D.C. these days, is the one to the Vietnam veterans. It would be difficult for any of us now living to think that the day might come when either of these memorials would be neglected. So, great care is taken in the establishment and the maintenance of either fixed statues or movable memorials. Religious memorials are essential to the continuance of religious faith. For example, in the Old Testament, when Joshua was about to lead the nation of Israel across the Jordan River into a conquest of the land of Canaan, he was told of God to choose 12 men, one man from each of the 12 tribes, who would each take a stone from the riverbed and pile them up at the place where the priest's feet stood as they bore the Ark of the Covenant crossing into the Promised Land. God said, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye they by these stones? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Now that story is recorded in Joshua the fourth chapter, and it was so. This is an example of a fixed monument testifying to an important event in a people's history. It didn't mean anything to anybody else. To other people, religiously, it was merely a pile of rocks. Well, God also gave them a movable memorial in the observance of the Sabbath day. In the Decalogue, he said, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence by a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy 5.15 So wherever the Jews would be, they could remember the day of their deliverance from slavery in Egypt by keeping the Sabbath day. Wouldn't mean anything to anybody else any more than the pile of rocks would mean something to someone else. But it would be a constant reminder to Israel of a very important event in their history. These memorials were important, even essential, to the continuance of Israel's faith. Not only did they have the written documents of the law which they were to teach to their children, but they could teach them by the use of these memorials. There were times in the history of Israel when they did not keep the Sabbath and the people forgot. They were once delivered by the hand of God out of slavery to Egypt and they lost their identity and went into bondage to other nations. Well, Christianity also has its memorial. The night before his agonizing crucifixion, Jesus being deity and knowing beforehand the events of the night in the coming day, met with his disciples to observe the Passover feast of the Jews, just we read a while ago. And I mentioned the Passover was another annual memorial of that dreadful night in Egypt when the Lord passed over Israel and the firstborn in every family in Egypt died, on whose doorposts the blood of the Passover lamb was not found. And that story is in Exodus 12. After they had eaten, Jesus took some of the bread and some of the wine used in that feast, and he instituted a memorial for Christians. Our text says, He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. With these two simple elements, not beautifully sculptured in costly stone, but a piece of bread and a cup of wine, this humble Galilean carpenter itinerant preacher erected a memorial to himself that still lives 
almost 20 centuries later. Oh, it's outlived many beautifully graven stone monuments erected to the memory of great men and events in the intervening years. Over the centuries, there have been billions of people who would rather die than to forsake that memorial. Isn't that fantastic? What powerful testimony to the deity of Jesus of Nazareth. We have the written documents, of course, in the New Testament, which affirm his deity. But in addition to that, we have the Lord's Supper that stands today as credible proof that Jesus Christ was more than a mere man. He was indeed the Son of God. Well, there have always been people who demanded some evidences outside of the written word of God, which will uh, confirm their faith. They want a miracle. They say that the word of God isn't enough, that the miracles recorded in the word of God are, are no longer observable. Hence, we stand in need of some other confirmation a modern miracle. Well, it's true that miracles in the biblical meaning of that word are no longer occurring. The Bible plainly says that the miracles Jesus did were to confirm his claims to deity, John 20, verses 30 and 31. And the miracles that were done by the apostles were done to confirm the gospel message revealed to them by the Holy Spirit, Mark 16 and 20. But some people want a modern miracle, something they can see with their own eyes. Well, the very presence of the Lord's Supper, if not a miracle in itself, in the 20th century church so closely borders on one that it would indeed be difficult to distinguish it from one. It still proclaims the deity of Jesus Christ. If he were not the Son of God, how do you account for the faithful, persistent observance of so simple a memorial, the Lord's Supper, in the 20th century church. As soon as the church began, the disciples began keeping this memorial with persistence and promptness. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And that breaking of bread, enumerated along with the other matters of worship, indicative of the Lord's Supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Holy Spirit instructing the church of God, which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in the manner of its observance of the Lord's Supper says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. Thus he established frequency. Now he doesn't say how frequent, whether it was an annual observance, semi-annual, quarterly, or sometime at their own discretion. He simply says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. But the New Testament isn't like an encyclopedia in which all the information on a given subject is under the heading of one, on, or on one page. We have to look elsewhere to see the frequency in which they observe this memorial feast. The book of Acts is an inspired historical account of the early days of the church. It's the only one we have. In the 20th chapter of that book, Paul is seen traveling with his friends. Luke the historian was among them. And he says in verses 6 and 7, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, to the Lord's Supper, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Well, the very use of the word when in this passage, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, indicates that the assembly of the disciples on the first day of the week for this purpose was anticipated. Paul and his company had stayed in Troas for seven days awaiting an assembly of the church. 
which they knew would be upon the first day of the week. It was the common practice of the early Christians to do so today. Wherever we're traveling, in this country or abroad, we can know that churches of Christ will be coming together on the first day of the week to keep the feast he established in his memory. Just like our first century counterparts, we may be coming together at other times, even on the Sabbath, for other purposes. But on the first day of the week, we assemble to break the bread and drink the cup of the Lord. According to Acts chapter 5, verse 42, early Christians met in the temple in every house uh, to preach and, uh, uh, and teach the Word of God. And in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, uh, it's said that they came together to pray. So we today may and we often do meet every day of the week to teach and preach the Word of God. We may even meet every day or on special occasions for prayer. But upon the first day of the week, we will be coming together to remember Christ to keep the memorial of Christ. Christ's memorial is important, even essential to the continuance of his church. The day of its observance, the first day of the week, and the place of its observance in the assembly of the Christians are as essential to its observance as July 4th is to the annual celebration of our independence. If Christians should neglect his memorial or cease to observe it upon the first day of the week, as we're taught in the New Testament scriptures, it will be with us as it was with Israel when they no longer kept the Sabbath day. We will raise up a generation of our own children who do not know God, who will have little regard for the faith which we hold dear, and who will forget the redemption Christ procured for all of us on the cross of Calvary. By our continual keeping of this memorial, Christians proclaim their faith in Christ's death. Till he comes. Thank you, our Father, for this memorial of Jesus. Thank you that it still lives. We pray that we can keep it alive and it will remain meaningful in generations yet to come. In his name we pray. Amen. you've had the experience most of us have of visiting the cemetery where loved ones are buried on Memorial Day or at some other time and just wandering around among the graves to see where friends are buried and, and coming upon a very unkept grave all grown up with weeds and grass with the marker tilted to one side maybe and because of the erosion of the earth around it and, and, and you push back the weeds where you can see the inscription on the marker to find the words gone but not forgotten. Well, that's sort of the way the Lord's memorial is neglected by some Christians and even some churches. With the emphasis on entertainment and worship nowadays, the Lord's Supper is often omitted, and if not omitted altogether, it's so perverted it's unrecognizable. It really isn't very entertaining. 
It's a rather solemn thing, actually. It doesn't appeal to the people who have to be amused in worship. There isn't a lot of hilarity about it. Rather, it's somewhat somber occasion, a moment of, moment of introspection or self-examination. So it just doesn't fit into some modern worship forms. Isn't it strange how we so freely and deliberately substitute our own likes and ways for the Lord's way of worship, then call him our Lord? For the person who has been baptized into the death of Christ and truly washed in his blood from all sins, according to Romans 6, 3 and 4, and Revelation 1 and 5, it's a great occasion every Sunday. Many thousands of saints wouldn't miss it. Our program is produced by the Church of Christ in Edmond, Oklahoma, and is presented on this station and others like it by locally autonomous churches of Christ because we love you and care about your special and spiritual needs. We'd really like to have you worship with us in a congregation near you. Would you? We observe the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, just as congregations of the Lord's Church did in New Testament days. We're trying not to be just another denomination or even the only right denomination. We're trying just to be Christians and churches just as you read about in the New Testament. A printed copy or an audio ca uh, cassette tape of today's program can be had absolutely free by writing or calling and asking for it. Our address is In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Or... Our toll-free telephone number is 1-800-321-8633. When you call or when you write, please request the program titled, Memorials Are Important. You don't have to send money, but please, would you tell us on what station you receive the program and be sure to tell us whether you want the transcript or the tape, whichever. Oh, we're so glad that you were with us today. I hope you can be next week, and I hope you can encourage some other people maybe to view the program with you, share these messages with them as well. If you've been blessed, perhaps they will too. We look to see you next time. God bless you now. We really do love you.